Suzanne is a graduate of the Royal College of Surgeons. She's worked in Ireland and internationally. She was a field epidemiologist in CDC in the States. She also had a very, very important part of her training in Limerick uh, with some people I know. And she is now a uh, specialist in public health medicine in vaccine preventable diseases in HPSC here in Dublin. Suzanne really is very, very knowledgeable about VPD and their epidemiology and has certainly kept everybody aware of the issues and what the actual picture is, which sometimes is different from what people perceive. So anyway, Suzanne, here's your time. I'm going to talk on uh, vaccine preventable disease epidemiology in Ireland and some recent outbreaks and uh, we've tried to tic tac with the other speakers to avoid overlap so obviously I'm not going to talk about everything um, but I'll leave some of the things to my, my other colleagues to talk about. Okay, so what I'm really going to focus on in this morning's uh, session is just the impact that vaccination has had on the Irish population and we've been monitoring it since 1948, uh, we had different types of data available to us, most of it in the 48s, 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s and early 90s was with the Department of Health and then when the NDSC and the HPSC as it's now known was established, um, we started to get more additional detailed information that has really helped understand the epidemiology of disease in Ireland. We've had numerous successes, as Kevin has said. Uh, some diseases have been eliminated, smallpox, that's beyond the memory of probably all of us. And um, others are extremely well controlled. You know, Hib, we hardly ever see any cases now. And then there are other diseases for elimination, being the measles and rubella, as Kevin said, and also polio. And I've bolded those diseases that I'm going to talk a little bit about this morning, and the ones that aren't highlighted or bolded, um, either other people will speak to, or else um, I, I won't be specifically referring to them. Hib, I'm not actually going to discuss, because we've had such a successful program. I'm going to talk a little bit about new vaccines that have come on the market in the past, 10, 12, 15 years, particularly the pneumococcal, meningococcal C was established and introduced in 2000, and then the B was introduced just a number of years ago, and then rotavirus, which Sarah Jackson will talk to. So we've had a lot of successes, but we've also had some re-emergence. Pertussis has been very well controlled, but has re-emerged and will be discussed later. Mumps is a current very topical issue, as is also meningococcal disease. Also, they've been well controlled historically, but we have seen some changes. And then there are new vaccines in the pipeline. Obviously, influenza is well established, but new vaccines are coming, and I know Lucy's going to talk to that, and, and generally about vaccine. And then other vaccines that aren't yet even being manufactured, but yet will be probably introduced within the next decade, I would say. So it'll be a changing feast. We'll have respiratory syncytial virus and probably group B, as well as other vaccines that will be introduced. So since 1996, the National Immunisation Advisory Committee in the RCPI, which was then established, has been publishing regular updates to the vaccination programme. Um, prior to that, it would have been kind of, you know, communications from the Department of Health on what vaccines were being provided and funded through the national programme. So these were hard copies, but it reached the stage with the 2013 edition which although it was a hard copy, initially it was decided we can't keep doing hard copies because we're always updating both the vaccines, the program, etc. So now everything is online at the HSE, um, the NIO immunization office. Okay, just very briefly, you're very familiar with this. This is the primary immunization program for the infants that are born. This is the uh, schedule that was introduced in, in 2016, and um, you're very familiar with that. So I'm just going to very briefly just move on from there. For those who just, who may be particularly new or want to have the acronyms, you know, what is the six in one, I've just included that and it will be available on the website, but again, I won't go through it in detail now. Okay, so just, the, just to say up front, obviously the immunizations have 
had the major impact on the epidemiology. So they are monitored systematically and routinely uh, within the HSE, both at local level and then at uh, the departments, public health level, immunisation offices, and then the data is collated and reported at the HPSC. So I want to thank all of you for the data that's been presented now, because it reflects the, the work that's been done. Uh, we report quarterly on the 12 and 24 month uptake and then we report annually on the academic and school uptake uh, as well as the influenza vaccine uptake. Okay, this is, I don't want you to look in detail, but this is just some of the data that is presented in the reports and on the HPSC website, which is available to you both. Uh, you can take new slide sets, take grab pictures and do presentations locally. We do look at obviously the national the national data at 12 months and 24 months, and we, we chart all the vaccines. So we're talking about all of them here, and this is quite small, so you don't see the detail. But essentially what you see is that after a very low dip back in about 2001, we've climbed up to the uptake for most of the vaccines is about 90% at 12 months of age. Then by 24 months of age, for a different cohort, this is taken from Q3 2018, the uptake for the 24-month children has actually increased for most, but not all of the vaccines, up to 95%. But we see some vaccines that are lagging behind, and these tend to include uh, some of the, the men B doses, some of the, vac the newer vaccines that are being given uh, that have not really caught up with the uptake for the other vaccines. We then also map the data by the areas, so you could actually look at your own specific data and compare yourself with the other areas. And the areas that are seen in red here and then in pink are the ones that are a lower uptake. So the red is the 80 to 84 percent. This is for the six in one vaccine, essentially the diphtheria antigen. And then the green areas are those 90 to 100 percent uptake. And in fact, at 12 months of age, no area has achieved that. However, by the 24-month age group for Q3 2018, many of the areas have achieved the 90, you know, the, uh, most of them actually are 95% about, with some being up as high as about 97% and sometimes 98%, but it varies. Um, but some areas still continue to have a lower uptake between the 85 to 89%. Um, you know, and so things evolve, things change, and, and we might talk a little bit later on reasons why there can be such variation. Okay, so I'm going to refer to our real successes, okay? Then probably most people here in the audience have never seen an acute polio case, and um, actually I have, but fortunately not in Ireland. Um, and, but this was the situation back in the 1950s in the United States where there was a major polio outbreak and this is the, the ward with all the iron lung patients. It was absolutely devastating. And people will remember, and there was a, written, a book written in Cork by uh, somebody by the name of Coborn, who was admitted to St. Finbar's with polio in the 1950s. Um, so it's very live in, kind of, I suppose, the, the older, the older in my, not my generation yet, but the older generation. And this is obviously a child with calipers and learning how to walk again. So there has been an enormous international movement because humans are the only reservoir for polio. And back in the 1980s, it was recognized that we could actually eliminate polio from the world. And so WHO, together with all the partners, Rotary International, UNICEF, and countries have managed to decrease the number of polio cases so that now it's only only wild polio cases are being identified in Nigeria, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, and not very many at that. But we still need to continue monitoring uh, throughout the world to make sure that we don't, as Kevin said, we can import disease so easily from different countries. And unless we're fully protected, we could see a case here. Um, but this is the situation, the fortunate situation we are in Ireland. This is polio notifications in Ireland since 1948 until 2018. The last case was reported in 1984, and we've had absolutely no cases since then. Uh, the polio vaccine was introduced back here in 1957 after what was an enormous outbreak with over you know, 400 cases, um, too late for many people that were affected by that polio outbreak in uh, 1955, I think it was. So, uh, so we're doing really well, but what we have, oops, sorry, 
What we have now is we have uh, acute flaccid paralysis uh, surveillance to identify any cases and investigate them quite rigorously as to whether or not children presented with an acute flaccid paralysis could, could they be polio? Is there any possibility? Because in fact, even in those countries where polio is identified, it's only about 1% of cases that are infected with the virus that will actually present with the paralysis. So we do have an ongoing surveillance. Okay, rubella is another disease, and apologies, we cut off, I cut off the top title there. Uh, rubella is one of the diseases that, again, is for elimination, and fortunately, we have eliminated it from Ireland, um, but it, that is dependent on continuing high uptake of rubella-containing vaccine. The program was introduced in 1971 for girls, um, and that continued up until 1988 when the MMR was introduced for both boys and girls. And we've had a number of programs since then. Uh, both the, the second dose was introduced in 1992 when it was recognized that one dose was not enough to protect individuals, uh, particularly from measles, and so the second dose was introduced. And then we had um, a measles rubella campaign in 1995 to kind of do a mop-up because there had been an increase in, in, in rubella, actually, and in also measles around that time and then the MMR2 uptake uh, age for administration was dropped in 1999. But as a result of which, you can see we're, nearly, we're at a flat line, essentially. So although we have not seen any acute rubella-confirmed cases, we continue to have rubella suspect cases reported, and they are as rigorously investigated as if they were rubella, because we need to identify um, if we have any cases occurring, because there is the potential, obviously, for transmission, we still have gaps in immunity, and we have pregnant women who are vulnerable still. Um, so we need to keep a, a handle on that. So that's a real success story. I'm not going to talk a lot about measles because Mary Ward, I know, is going to talk about outbreaks with a focus on measles. But I want to fo just show you, really, I've grayed out the graph, just to show you, I wasn't going to talk to it a lot. But basically, look, we are 14,000 cases there in the 1950s, and look where we are there now. So that is absolutely incredible, and it's a great tribute to the work that has been done by all the GPs, all the practices, all the hospitals, the clinicians, everybody working, and the NIO, in the immunization program. So we've really done very, very well. And as it, Kevin said, we've done so well, but we are very much scrutinized by WHO. And this is a slide, this is a report that WHO does every year after it has assessed the measles and rubella status of each country in Europe. Uh, and worldwide, they do this report, and this is the Irish report, and as you can see, they do a little summary, it's a kind of a nice graphic thing of how we're doing, but I want you to look particularly at that. In 2017, it was determined by WHO that we had eliminated both measles and rubella, and as Kevin said, we expect the 2018 report to have a similar, you know, kind of, I suppose, uh, uh, feedback from WHO that we continue to have it eliminated. However, as you all know, we've had numerous cases of measles, but we've been able to demonstrate that they have been imported. But we really are very carefully scrutinized, and I think whenever of the investigations are going on, we get all the data, and the Departments of Public Health and Mary will report to it. It takes an enormous amount of data to investigate all of our, our, the cases that are reported, including the rubella cases, that we kind of inevitably feel are going to be negative, but we still investigate them thoroughly. Now I'm going to move on to one of the newer vaccines in the primary immunization program. So the PCV vaccine was introduced back in 2006, uh, 2008 rather, sorry, and uh, PCV7, so it protected against seven of the 90 serotypes of the pneumococcal, more than 90 serotypes. And in this graph, which I just want to show the impact of the vaccine. We've been able, with the help of the reference laboratory in Temple Street, to actually zero, zero type the isolates in children that do, do, get, do get pneumococcal disease. So when the vaccine was introduced in 2008, you immediately see in the less than two year age group, so in other words, the vaccinated cohort, this rapid drop down, all the way down 
to really low levels of the PCV vaccine. So it showed the immediate impact that this vaccine was having on the vaccinated cohort, but also what you see is a, an indirect impact it was having on the other age groups that were not actually targeted by the vaccination. And so this is really a reflection of the fact that by, vac by protecting the children, we were also protecting the wider community from disease. And then in uh, uh, 2010, a PCV-13, so a 13 um, valent vaccine came on the market, which gave broader protection against 13. So it included the seven in the 2008 vaccine, but also an additional six there. So what we again were monitoring is we see again that there was a decline in the less than two year age group following its introduction. Okay? Not as smooth sailing as for the PCV7, but it was a, a decline. We've also seen it in other age groups, again in the over 65 year age group, with a delay. And so that's all good news. And then you say, well, why were there some blips? Well, it wasn't 100% effective. No vaccine is, and there were some sero serotypes within the vaccine that weren't actually had as good vaccine efficacy as the other ones. So that has been a, a recognition of a, a bit of a problem. But what we did see, and what I want you to, to look at here, is we have seen an emergence of the non-PCV13 serotypes. So this graph demonstrates the non-PCV13 by age group by year. And what we've seen, particularly in the over 65, the emergence, a gradual increase, but we've also been seeing it in the children less than two years of age, a kind of a gradual increase. So obviously it's a worry, um, but what it, it reflects is the fact that these pneumococcal is a very smart bug. Okay, it's, going, it's mutating a little bit, there's a, a replacement phenomenon going on and we'll have to see whether or not this becomes a, quite a serious problem. Um, you know, but at the same time that these trends are happening, the pharmaceutical industry is frequently working behind the scenes to increase the new or develop new vaccines that will address some of these uh, uh, ones that aren't covered in the current vaccines. Okay. I'm going to talk very, just very briefly about the meningococcal. So the meningococcal C vaccine was introduced in, uh, here in 2000, okay? Prior to that, and many of you here will remember the enormous number of cases that we were seeing in Ireland at the late 1990s. We were in a hyper-endemic situation. Both in Ireland, the UK was seeing it as well, also the Netherlands and some other countries. And so there was a, a men's C vaccine available and it was introduced both uh, to all children and there was a catch-up up to this, you know, university students less than 23 years of age. So what we have here is in green, you see this, the meningococcal C. That was the only vaccine available. So that was introduced here and look at the rapid decline in C, okay? Little, little bits of green along the way. Apologies if anybody has read green blindness. I should have thought of that. But anyway, we are seeing really decline. But then back here, okay, we started to see a number of cases emerging, all right? And this was a, a big concern. And it was at this time that studies based in the UK had identified that fact there was an element of waning immunity in adolescents who'd been vaccinated in the UK back here. And so in anticipation of that, NIAC recommended a booster dose for children in 2014 in the school program. So that's what you're, many of you are familiar with. Um, it wasn't a big catch-up, it was just aimed at the adolescents, um, and we continued to see kind of an emergence, both in the adolescents, predominantly in uh, the teenagers and the young adult, um, with the, I suppose, most cases in 2017. But it seems to be, possibly, hopefully, you know, we, we seem to be kind of nipping it in the bud, we hope, with the Cs. However, B has always been a problem. B, we had a lot of cases back then, and we've had a gradual decline, completely unrelated to the C vaccination program because there's no cross protection. But a B vaccine did become available and was introduced, by, recommended by NIAC and introduced uh, in the HSC um, in 2016. And so what we have seen is a continued decline of, of B, uh, which is great. 
um, and very few actually of year to date. So, but we have to monitor the situation. So this is a combination undoubtedly, because the meningococcal B affects predominantly the youngest age group, less than one year of age. So this is a reflection of that, um, and I haven't shown the data by age group, but there is certainly an impact occurring in the children. The problem with B vaccine is that it doesn't give a herd protection, unlike the C vaccine, which, which does. So. Okay. Now, I'm just going to show you actually here, sorry, I did have a slide, but the meningococcal B. So here we have the Ben B vaccine introduced here in 2016, and this is the current situation of Bs, okay? Um, of all the Bs, okay? And then in the less than one year age group, following the introduction, you see quite a marked decline there, okay? Sorry, I'd forgotten I had included that. So that's a very nice graph demonstrating the impact of that vaccine in the Irish population. Okay, mumps. We all know there's a lot of mumps, um, unfortunately. Uh, this, we, it started to kick off really, there was activity occurring from September, August, September last year, um, but it started to really kick off in the beginning of this year. And this red line just demonstrates from week one what the activity has been like. We wrote about this in, in the Epi Insight in April, just to highlight the difference and the marked increase in comparison to last year's data, okay? Um, so we've got a national mumps outbreak team convened. A number of materials have been developed. There's been a lot of um, promotion and awareness raising. A lot of testing is being done by the NVRL. It's occurring predominantly in the uh, the adolescent and young adult group. Um, mumps vaccine is available under the OCT code, and um, so we hope that with the summer coming we may be seeing uh, some decrease, but we're, we're still waiting. This is the situation historically. So mumps only became notifiable in 1988, at the time that the MMR vaccine was introduced. Again, similar to the, the measles graph, you know, this is what happened. We had a measles rubella campaign in 95. The, M the mumps component was not included in the vaccine. And then we saw a big increase in cases in 2004, 2005, which actually we were attributing to the fact that there hadn't been mumps included in this campaign when there was a catch up. But unfortunately, during the pandemic, we had more than 3,000 cases reported in the country. And it was absolutely enormous. It affected mainly the, again, adolescents and the young adults. Many, most were students or in that kind of age group. And because of the pandemic flu going on and all that activity and the focus on that, um, many people probably weren't that aware of it, but there was an MMR campaign introduced into the school um, both for the, for the senior kind of secondary level students and then there were catch-up campaigns for other students in going down the going, going down to junior levels in uh, secondary schools and then even into the primary schools but we've seen another one so despite all the activity we're seeing another outbreak back in 2014 and now this one so what's it all about this graph just demonstrates the bumps notifications by age group and year. So we didn't have any age group data early on, but the data was all going to uh, Department of Health. And that was just a phenomenon of the time. You know, it wasn't possible to get um, detailed data. This was all aggregate number of cases. But in 2000, when I suppose NDSC was established and there were kind of new methods and possibilities to collect additional data, age groups started to be reported. And so when we had this massive outbreak and something has turned upside down, apologies, um, we can actually see that the majority of cases were here, okay, in the 15 to 24 age group, okay, that's where most of the cases were. And in all the subsequent years, whenever there are these big outbreak years, most of the cases are occurring in this age group. So it would appear that it's a combination of, we know that many of them are vaccinated now. Earlier on, back here, we had hardly any vaccination status and we still knew there were lots of gaps in immunity. Even here, there were lots of gaps in immunity. There's still gaps in immunity here, but probably less so. So what we have is a combination of 
uh, un or under vaccinated as well as fully vaccinated and waning immunity uh, which has been described elsewhere and internationally and the question is what to do about it because there's not good evidence that giving a third dose will give long-term protection so most countries um, that are experiencing similar situations have not introduced a third dose of MMR um, and certainly in Ireland we have not recommended a third dose for all people um, but what we do recommend is if people are unsure of their vaccination status they should be uh, vaccinated for sure with an MMR. Okay. This is just a, another graph demonstrating the number of doses as a percent of all the cases that are reported in the most recent um, mumps outbreak, um, starting in last kind of August time until this week. So what we see is that amongst all ages, but we have to remember that the, all, most of the cases are actually in this age group. Um, for most of them, we actually don't know whether or not they've been vaccinated. We don't have any data, it's unknown, they don't know, or they say they've had none. So, you know, for a lot of cases, we really don't know the situation in Ireland. Unlike in many other countries where they have, particularly in the United States, where they've got really good immunization registries that are readily available um, to find out the vaccination status of, of all the students. Um, and they also have very, you know, they tend to have their vaccine cards as well. But what we do know is that of the cases that are reporting the vaccination status, um, you know, just about 10% are reporting one dose. So this is all ages. So some of these would be young children who would only actually be eligible for one dose. And then we have a large proportion, the majority probably about 25% are reporting two doses. But I w just want to say that this is self-reported and not all of it is validated. Some are validated, but not all. So, you know, there's always a bit of a query over self-reported. And this is amongst the 15 to 24 year age group. Again, the majority of them either we don't have data on their vaccination status um, or they don't know, they say they've had none. And then still about 10% say they've only had one. So this is a group that we've been targeting for years to say, listen, if you haven't had two doses of vaccine, get your vaccine. But we still have this group here. And then we have about 25% who reported two doses. We had a quick look at the data. And what it suggests is that although there have there have been cases hospitalized amongst those with two doses, um, the data suggests that they're at a, a kind of population level, they're less sick than those who are not vaccinated. Um, but it hasn't, the numbers are small and it's not statistically significant, so we'll wait until we can have a little bit more data, analyze it better. Okay. Um, apologies, this has shifted again. Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly, because there's other talks about influenza. But influenza, we have seasonal peaks, so we kind of have a every year we have these outbreaks, a seasonal outbreak of uh, influenza. But they're all different, as we are, apologies, familiar with. We have different, different strains of viruses, different years, okay? This was the big pandemic. Um, this year, 2017-18, uh, this is taken from the HPSC annual report of 2018, it's all available on the website, was predominantly um, AH3, uh, a B, AH1, and a lot of cases, okay? So this, this demonstrates that really influenza is obviously a major public health problem in, in Ireland as internationally, okay? And just to demonstrate the severity of the disease, the, the number of cases in 2017-18, we don't have the most recent data available for this past season, was over 2,000 cases, okay? With an age-specific incidence rate of over 352 amongst the 65-year-olds. So it's a major burden for the elderly population, okay? With over 85 cases admitted to, to hospital. So this is really why every year there's such a focus on influenza, trying to prevent disease with vaccination. So I'll just leave it at that. I'll just highlight and again the over 65 being the age group most affected. Okay. So part of the drive in influenza vaccination has really to also to protect the patients, but obviously by protecting your staff, you're also protecting your patients. And so every year there's a big launch by NIO and HSE of uh, trying to get healthcare workers vaccinated and the population. 
Um, so this is highlighted through different, different um, modes, and this is an article taken in October 2018. So this data on the uptake in the HSE healthcare uh, population, healthcare worker population. This report is from 2017-18. We don't have the most recent final data available yet to report on. But when you can see is that from 2011-2012, okay, seen in red, this is by different support groups. But you see that the uptake back in 2011-2012 amongst all the healthcare workers was just 18%. And by 1718, it had gone up to 44, over 44%. So there's been a massive improvement in uptake, which is a reflection of all the work and the endeavor that's gone into to maximizing and kind of mobilizing staff and vaccinators. Okay, so just to end on the key points of, of uh, this, I suppose, my, my talk this morning, is I hope I've demonstrated that vaccines have had a major positive impact on decreasing uh, vaccine preventable diseases in Ireland. Um, we need the surveillance data um, to inform both our policies and our programs, you know, the NIAC policies and recommendations, and then the HSE, the programs that are run, you know, what age groups they're going to recommend them for, how is it going to be rolled out. Uh, to inform, you know, how to make a most successful program. There have been lots of changes in epidemiology in Ireland over time. We've seen the positive, um, you know, successes. All of them have been successful, but in some of them we've seen where there's been a, an emergence of disease that we need to understand very well to see how do we tweak, how do we tweak our program, when do we decide to introduce a new program, at what cost, and what will be the value. And also, there are always new vaccines coming down the line. So for many of our diseases that we have under surveillance, we need to be having a disease under surveillance even before the vaccine is going to be introduced. So for rotavirus that you'll hear about later, um, you, know, you need to know the historical baseline trends before you're going to introduce a vaccine. So we always need to be on the ball and monitoring the situation. As I've, I've just really touched on a little bit, is we have gaps in immunity, uh, both in the, the adult population, the pediatric population, migrant population, I haven't discussed that a lot, and uh, minority populations, and we need to understand why this is happening, because we need to address it, because vaccines are for everybody, we need to protect the whole population, and to understand why some people may either be choosing not to get it, or we may, may not be, I suppose, reaching out or making it easy for them to get the vaccine. And just finally, I'd like to end on the note that healthcare workers, in all the studies that have been done, um, healthcare workers are the most important and trusted sources of VPD information for the general public. You know, for the parents, for your grandparents, for, the, for everybody. They'll say to you, either as a neighbor or as an aunt or an uncle, or, you know, what do you think about this new vaccine? So they will listen to you. So having healthcare workers that are up to date on what's happening and understanding sometimes what's a rumor mill out there and being able to sift through fact from fiction is really invaluable. And um, so I know you're, you're all doing that regularly. So I'd just like to thank everybody. Obviously, the data I've presented here is from you. It's from everybody uh, in the audience, both here and, and elsewhere. Um, because, uh, but we're, we're stronger together with the data we have. We understand the situation. So I just want to thank everybody, and thank you for your attention.